Thank you for listening to the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast with host Clara and Jimmy Hinton. If you're new to the podcast, please subscribe and share so you never miss an episode. Search for us on your favorite podcast app, or you can find the podcast on jimmyhinton.org and findingahealingplace.com. Please rate our show, subscribe, and share so we can spread the word. If you would like to support us and get exclusive rewards, go to patreon.com slash speaking out. Find a tier that best fits you and join as a patron of the podcast. Now let's get into the show. Oh, well, welcome to this week's podcast with host Jimmy Hinton. And Jimmy's mom, Clara. And go ahead. we have a special guest. Clara's daughter and Jimmy's sister. Yes. Alex. 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 Yes. So Alex, um, Alex is the courageous survivor who changed our lives forever. Um, in a, in a very good way, I think. Um, Alex is the one who I mentioned in my book. Um, she's the one who, uh, came forward on uh, whenever Heather Sells did a special with CBN News. Um, Alex is the one who disclosed abuse, and that's how Mom and I found out that um, my dad, our dad, uh, your former husband was an abuser. Up to that point, we had no idea. So um, I can't believe, Alex, that it's been this long since we've invited you on the show. (laughs) (laughs) We've only been podcasting for over two years. Um, but I finally was like, you know what? Um, it's, that's kind of a travesty to not have you on the show and, and to talk about it from your perspective. People nice. have heard from our perspective. Exactly. So, um, yes. I think it's time that they hear from your perspective. Um, so I'll, I'll start a little bit for those who don't know, um, how this kind of unfolded. I'll just give like a, a super abridged version of this, but um, I still remember the date, July 29th, uh, 2011. Uh, Alex had scheduled a meeting with me. Uh, Mom, you had, I think you had called me I had and kind of tipped you. me off that Alex yeah. was going to be scheduling an appointment I with did. me. I um, did. Alex, uh, I was working in my office one evening, late at night. It was around midnight when I received an email from Alex, who was sitting in her bedroom which, um, you know, she, we, we did that sometimes, just kind of shoot off a good night or a funny, you know, email or something like that. Only this email was different. Um, this email had a subject line of description of a pedophile. And um, that description and that email was the beginning of a big change not only for our lives, for our families, but also, and thankfully, for the lives of many children to come. Thanks to Alex's sending that one email that in return, I I contacted Jimmy, Mm -hmm. and Jimmy, you can take it from there. Yeah, so I was I, I was um, only two years into my my job as a preacher uh, at the church that we grew up at. Um, that's the church that our dad preached at for 27 years. Um, I was hired in June of 2009, so July of 2011, two years later, um, Alex was scheduling an appointment to come talk to me on a Friday afternoon. Um, so Alex came up and... Um, I don't think it's important to give a whole lot of details from that day. You probably don't want to relive it. Um, but, you know, Alex came in. She she just said hello to me, handed me a piece of paper that was an email, email exchange uh, between her and someone else that described um, a night that they were both abused um, by my dad. So that's how I found out. Uh, and I write about this in, in the uh, my memoir, The Devil Inside, uh, from my perspective, what that was like sitting in my seat, having Alex across from me and uh, disclosing that to me. So, you know, long story short, um, I believed Alex immediately. Um, I told Alex that the only thing I could promise her is that it stops now. Um, and then I called mom as soon as Alex left. Mm-hmm. And uh, we both unanimously almost said at the same time, um, we need to report this. Yeah. 
So um, we, we never entertained any other idea. Let me say that Alex, with that email, then she and I spent, it, it was quite a horrific night that night together, as she shared with me um, the abuse. And Jimmy and I both had the same reaction. It was immediate belief mm -hmm. in Alex. There was no hesitation whatsoever um, that we did not believe or understand the depth of what she was saying. And I still yet, this many years later, look at Alex. Um, she is the youngest of our tribe of 11 kids. And I look at her with respect uh, for the amount of courage that it took to do what she did. And believe me, that took a lot of courage because this was not only going to change our lives as we knew it, the lives of our family, the lives of our community, the life of lives of those people in our church, but so many others. And she did it. Yeah. And that I, yeah. I think is real bravery. Massive. Yes. So my question for you, Alex, um, because I try to think about this and I, I mean, I've spoken to hundreds of survivors of abuse, um, since that fateful mm day. Um, I was in such, such a weird position, I think, um, for you, because one, I was somebody of the opposite sex. Um, I was your brother am your brother still just <laughs> want to clear that up um i'm your brother i uh am also your abuser's son and i'm a minister um just like your abuser at the church where he preached so certainly from from a victim's perspective a lot of really difficult hurdles for you to overcome just to report to me so what what gave you the motivation and the courage to reach out to both mom and I and to dis disclose abuse that day. What what made you decide now's the time? Um, so I was 20 years old at the time. I was a college student and I was home from college for the summer. Um, every summer while I was in college, I would come home and stay at mom's for the summer and work. Um, and my dad was babysitting kids at the time and he had asked me, twice towards the beginning of that summer to help him babysit kids um, and both of those times there were red flags that I picked up on from the kids that made me think that probably they were being abused but I didn't have any physical evidence and I really had no idea what to do how can you report a gut feeling or a red flag with no hard evidence and that's why I began to um, research the signs of an abuser and the signs of someone who has been abused. Um, and then once everything clicked for me, I first thing I thought of was telling mom, um, hoping that she would kind of give me some guidance as to where to go from there. And she gave me the guidance to talk to you. <laughs> go yeah. talk to Jimmy. You don't see Jimmy. <laughs> Luckily, all the things you said, being male, family member, preacher, um, none of that really discouraged me from talking to you because I didn't have any reason to think I couldn't trust you. Like, no yeah. recollection of you ever doing anything but being, you know, someone I could trust. So. See, this is kind of interesting to me now because mm -hmm. in hindsight, I, I look at how rare it is for somebody in my position to believe as survivor, which blows my mind. I mm -hmm. like, I, I still can't wrap my mind around it, yeah. but for you, like I know, I know you've seen it tons of times where friends of yours or, um, people that you've interacted with, um, who you never met before who are survivors of abuse, they didn't have that same yeah. uh, mm -hmm. response. Mm -hmm. So, you know, looking back now, are you like, are you, do you think, holy crap, this could have wound up completely differently, um, yeah. If I hadn't believed you. Definitely could have. Um, I mean, it's hard to think now what I would have done in that situation if you hadn't believed me. I would like to think that since my motivation was protecting the kids that I thought at the time were currently being abused, I would have gone to the police myself. Um, but it definitely helped having that backup and someone, you know, to help 
start the whole investigation process for me. Yeah. You know, um, I think what's one of the things that we've talked about before is that we just make the assumption or have made the assumption that you didn't tell us just to get something off your shoulders. No. That that survivors of abuse rarely tell somebody just because they want to get something off their chest. Um, We started with the assumption, and I think just kind of naturally, we didn't talk about it. And you and I didn't talk about it. Mm -hmm. I wasn't like, well, Alex, what do you want me to do? I never asked Alex that. Um, We just started with this gut assumption that you wanted action, that you wanted something to happen. Um, And we were kind of the catalyst to, to make that happen Mm -hmm. uh we were put in a position whether we liked it or not and we didn't like it Mm -hmm. um but it didn't matter you know about any step of this there was nothing easy about from the very first step of alex sending that email the moment she hit send life changed Mm -hmm. it was going to change permanently right whether it changed in the right direction that she wanted or not, yeah. life was going to change. Had I said, Alex, you're, you are just out in left field. I don't think anything you're saying is, it doesn't make sense. Had I said that and stopped it right there, and she had then had had to go on to the police alone, which she would have. She was determined mm-hmm. to protect those children. There would have been such a broken relationship in our family that I think never would have been able to be mended. Which happens most right. of the time yeah. with and, disclosures and, and, and abuse. And I shudder to think about that. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that was definitely one of my concerns. Like, I had a million hypotheticals running through my mm-hmm. head at the time. Like, what's this going to do to our family? What's going to happen to me? What's going to happen if I tell someone in the family and they, you know, shut me out and, mm-hmm. you know, take dad's side instead of mine? But I had to take the importance off of myself and put it on the kids who were being abused because that was really all that mattered at the time. Well, that brings up a whole nother, I mean, a whole nother subtopic. Um, and that is the the determination that the vast majority of, of abuse victims have to keep abusers from abusing other kids. Mm-hmm. And there's this, mm-hmm. there's this um, myth out there that... Oh, if you've been abused, especially for male victims, if you've been abused, you're, you're, you know, you're likely to be abusing kids too. And that's Mm -hmm. a question that people ask me Mm -hmm. routinely when I go places, they say, was your dad ever abused? My answer is, what does it matter? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I don't, it depends on who you talk to because he's told different people, different things, but what does it matter if he's been abused? That doesn't determine whether somebody abuses somebody else. In fact, um, the vast, overwhelming majority of the time, and and statistics research shows this, that people who've been sexually abused will do everything in their power to make sure that that never happens to any other kid. And that's a case in point. I mean, just that sheer determination Mm -hmm. because you know know what it is what it was like and what it's still like as an adult Mm -hmm. to have been abused as a kid. And Mm -hmm. it it sucks. Like there's no way around it. And, um, you know, victims will, they will really fight tooth and nail to make sure that abusers are stopped. And as a church leader who consults with churches and I train churches and I hear from survivors from all different walks of life, Church leaders interpret that as, boy, you're just bitter, you know, mm. like you just you haven't gotten over what happened to you. And we've all had stuff happen. And, and you know, you don't see us uh, standing on a soapbox and, and outing people who wronged us at every step of the way through life. And they don't understand that there's there's so much determination on the part of the abuser to keep abusing and to keep producing victims and to keep the secrecy, they do not stop. Mm-hmm. They do not stop abusing. Um, so when so when survivors of abuse go to leaders at churches or go to to leaders at 
schools or whatever the organization I was is. They are legislators also right. for Pete's sake. They're, they're not to help to protect the it, children. It's yeah, like they're not doing people. it because it's comfortable yeah. or it's fun no, it's or it's enjoyable. No. They're doing it because they want to see some sort of action. Yes. They want I mean, to see abusers stopped. Absolutely. And that's it. Right. Um, so were you surprised that we all believed you right away? I mean, trying to look back on that day, I honestly don't even remember exactly what my expectations were because it was just mm -hmm. completely overwhelming. So I can't say if I remember if I was surprised or not. I think what I remember feeling is relief. Like, okay, something is going to be done. I did what I could and you know, we're going to see this through. Something's going to happen. Yeah. Um, so it was just a major I sense of relief. I love that word, relief, that you used. Because in my mind, for years, and I blogged about it, I knew something wasn't right. I just didn't know what that something was. But none I of us suspected never abuse. Never in a million years. I mean, none of us did. Abuse that many years ago was not a public word. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had to read your email just over and over again because I had never said the word pedophile. Yeah. Ever. I had never used the word. I uh, didn't know anything about pedophiles. It was, nor did we know any yeah, pedophiles. Yeah, nor did we know any pedophiles. Exactly. Now that word is commonplace. Little children yeah. know it. I mean, they've been taught the word abuse and all that. At that point in time, that was new knowledge. Um, you know, and, and it's like, you know there's something there. Your gut tells you, but you don't know what it is. And now, it was the light bulb for me. She, Alex felt relief. So did I. The light bulb went off. Bingo. Now mm -hmm. everything started fitting together. The, you know, all those, as you called, the red flags with the young children that you saw that he was with, mm -hmm. babysitting. It was, like a, it was like a million movies, clips of movies flashing in my mind. And we did that all through the night as we cried. I remember laying on the bed, just holding each other and crying. And, and it was like those movie clips playing over and over. Everything fit. It fit. Finally. Finally. Mm -hmm. yeah. Relief. I, I think I felt relief, too. Well, it was finally something, you know, made sense. Yeah. Well, I think that's definitely um, one of the benefits to talking to other people about it if they can actually take your side and support you and help you fit the pieces together because for me as a victim it was really strange especially it being my own father I just second-guessed everything and like all I had were very small clips of flashbacks like I don't remember how old I was mm -hmm. or many specific details just tiny little flashes of a memory where I would second-guess myself like okay, maybe I'm remembering that wrong, maybe it wasn't really abuse, even though I didn't like that this happened, maybe it wasn't wrong, and it, it was just so much going on in my head that, you know, I didn't know what to do with. Yeah. Yeah, and I, you know, I think you and mom processing that together really helped to put those pieces to the puzzle together. Mm -hmm. Um for me, I was in kind of a different position because it, my role, mm -hmm. I felt like my role was to see this through to the end. Mm -hmm. um, and it was. To, and that's why yeah. we both leaned on you. You know, what do we do with this? We go to Jimmy. Yeah. And, and I mean, you, you and I went to the police station yes. together. but mm -hmm. um, And we supported you. And mm -hmm. I remember us saying, like, are you sure um, you want to go to the police station mm -hmm. uh, that that you're willing to speak because once we report, like there's no getting, there's no backing out of that. Right. Um, and, right. and Alex was, I mean, just as firm as could be from mm -hmm. start to finish. She was, and she was like, yeah, yeah I, she I need rock. to do this. She was a rock. Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, it was just that, that courage and, 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 and your courage empowered other family members to come forward mm -hmm. who, who had never told anybody. And all of you guys mm -hmm. thought that you were the only one. Um, everybody within the family 
uh, thought that they were the only one, which, which is really, really common um, for abuse victims um, because, because that's what abusers do. They make you think, they isolate you, make yeah. you think that you're the only one um, because the more they can push you off on, on this little island by yourself, it makes it nearly impossible to report. And, and that's all by design. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm, I'm so proud of the way that our family from the very beginning stuck with each other. All the brothers mm -hmm. stuck by the sister's sides. There was not one, I can't remember one single instance with the exception of a couple of family members that cussed me out for, for <laughs> reporting. Um, but that was short lived, you know, I think that's a normal response I think that was because a of the shock response. of it. it. Yeah, it was a shock. But it wasn't, it wasn't like, why would you do that? No. Um, he's innocent. Right. It was, no. it was, we didn't have time to even think process about this it. and process yeah. this. And like why gonna be you didn't talk to the family over, before yeah. reporting it. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, no, I mean, we didn't we talk didn't. to anybody, but, but no, Alex, yeah. um, and we, I mean, that was on a Friday. Um, right before I did a, a wedding rehearsal, and then Saturday a wedding, and then Sunday preached, and then Monday morning we were in the police station we there, reporting yeah. it. Um, so this all happened really, really quickly. But, yeah, I'm just, I think looking back, um, I almost feel a little bit guilty telling people our story because it's so rare. It's so rare for especially a family this big for everybody literally to stick together always. We have never, mm -hmm. I mean, it's been, what, 10, almost 10 years mm -hmm. now? Mm -hmm. I can't think of a time where we were divided over this. I think that's probably one of the biggest blessings we have as a family is the support yeah. that was there. Um, and it was there, and I don't know what made it so strong um, except that, I don't know, you, you all you cultivated that all growing up. You were a strong, close bunch of kids. But even within that strong, close unit, here we have a, a, a child saying there was abuse going on and no one knew it. Then you have another one who speaks up and says, well, I thought I was the only mm -hmm. one. So even within strong family units, there can be those hidden secrets. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that people need to understand. Abuse, uh, the abuser knows this and is crafty and smart and articulate in the way they abuse. And they know most often they'll get away with it because there is this fear of crumbling a family, of mm -hmm. crushing a family. And I, I think maybe your dad was counting on that. I that think that's what he used. Yeah. I mean, I've yeah. I've yes. maintained contact with him, and um, one of the things that he's told me is I didn't I didn't threaten my victims because I didn't have to. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. yeah. And and there's this picture that out there in the advocacy world that abusers are, are looking for all these vulnerabilities. They're looking for the kid who has a bad home. They're looking for the kid who doesn't have daddy affection. They're looking for the kid who, um, you know, comes from in and out of foster care and right. those sorts of things. And, and they target those people and they shower them with love and they give them everything that they didn't have. I would say that for the vast majority of dad's victims, the exact opposite was true. He, he targeted families that had a super strong bond mm -hmm. where there was a strong presence um of a of a father um you know there were all these all these things that he used but and, and he's talked to me about that and he said there are people who do that but those are he said the the majority of abusers look at those people and we're like those people are stupid because they're just lazy mm -hmm. Um, so your average abuser, if you think about that for a minute, just how calculated and how evil yes. and how twisted this is, your average abuser doesn't target kids with all these vulnerabilities and gaping mm -hmm. holes in their lives. They target kids with normal, happy, healthy families. Um, and, and I don't know that it's necessarily any more difficult for the abuser to do that than to find 
these vulnerable kids that are in broken homes. And I think that's what people need to understand is right. that anybody can be a target. That's, like, yeah. that's the whole point. Level of right. education yes. doesn't matter. No. Um, level of love within the home doesn't no. matter. Um, whether a home's broken or put together and really tight knit doesn't matter. Um, so we are a prime example. It can happen to any family. Absolutely. Any family. We were in church three times a week. Mm -hmm. The kids loved church, loved church camp, loved, um, you know, all of that. Um, all of us had a very normal, healthy social very, life. Lots of friends. We so. hung out all the yes. time. Active in school, you know, that whole Good grades. Um, nothing going on at home that would be like, wow, you know, it was a happy home. It was a yeah. fun childhood for everybody. And yet, within this unit, there was all this travesty going on. Yeah. Without people, you know, and it was a secret. It was a tight, held yeah. secret. And your dad, being the kingpin of it all, knew. And I think mm -hmm. he felt real secure in that. I, I know don't he think did. he felt at all vulnerable or at all that any one of the children would ever so-called betray him because mm -hmm. he was such a fun loving great dad yeah and what a mixed feeling uh, i'm sure in your mind still there has to be so much he was the fun one i was the grouchy the the mom slamming cupboard doors and hollering and making rules and he was not he was mm -hmm. the patient kind fun person mm -hmm. you know and and i think he he thought for sure he had his little army secured but um truth always wins always well i think that's what that's what really shocked him is that you know and, and i have a really different perspective and you and i have never spoken about this so alex is hearing this for the first time um but he was convinced that it was an accidental disclosure from one of the little girls that he was babysitting because he couldn't figure so, out. He no. he never ever entertained the yeah. idea that an adult victim uh, would mm -hmm. have rolled on him. That didn't even enter his mind. Um, he thought it was an accidental disclosure because he had heard, um, he'd overheard one of the little girls say, hey, I saw Mr. John's penis. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, one of the little girls had said something like that at church. So in his mind, this oh, is one of his. Somebody other, heard that one okay. of his and other reported yeah. that. Yeah. Right. One of the right. little girls that Alex witnessed uh, him interacting with. So, you know, in his mind, there there was an impossibility of right. an adult victim turning on him, and that's how. That's how much of a grip he thought he so had. How secure he felt. Yeah, he I mean, absolutely, a hundred percent confident. Absolutely. Yeah. So I know this is a hypothetical question for you, Alex, because it didn't. Um, you know, obviously, it turned out very differently. But what? What do you think would have happened if we hadn't believed you? If even one of us hadn't believed you? Um, I think I would have felt even more isolated and afraid and. Maybe I would have second guessed myself as far as reporting. Like, it might have taken me a little bit longer to work up the courage to go to the police on my own, but I think ultimately I still would have made that decision because I didn't think in my mind, like, knowing this was most likely happening to these kids, I don't think I could have just let that go and kept yeah. quiet. Yeah. I think it just shows the importance, too, of believing whenever people disclose abuse and that like i i have a whole chapter on this in, in my book where i talk about beginning with righteousness and justice like that's that's this foundation that's found in the bible and whether you believe in god or not like it doesn't matter there's still this foundation that's foundational for our lives where there's righteousness and justice and that term for righteousness was a term it was actually a term that was used in the marketplace for balancing scales. Mm -hmm. um, it literally means um, righteousness means beginning with balanced scales. You don't tip the scale mm -hmm. in either direction for anybody. So you don't tip it and say, well, you know, we see this, this with racism all the time, right? right. Well, yeah. you know, they're just... 
they're just the the black kids that live in the projects. You're tipping that scale against somebody. Right. But the same is true where you can tip the scales in favor of somebody. Well, I mean, gee, Alex, this is what, what tipping the scales would look like. Well, gee, Alex, you know, I grew up in the same house as you, and I've never seen anything weird with him. Right. I've mm -hmm. known him my whole life, and mm -hmm. where's this coming from? That's tipping the scale in favor of somebody, mm -hmm. where you're banking on your relationship, your emotional connection, um, your your peer relationship, whatever it is. You're tipping the scale in favor of somebody, and you're disregarding the facts that are in front of you. So, you know, to begin with balanced scales um, and this notion of justice where you're going to meet out whatever is owed somebody, good or bad. So I, I think what's interesting about that whole idea is that that's what abuse victims constantly have to do to survive. It's this suspension mm -hmm. of everything they think think they know about somebody and saying, holy cow, something's not right with the way this person's treating me and the things right. they're doing to me. And I think it becomes so incredibly confusing for victims when they're able to meet out righteousness and justice properly um, as a survival technique, if nothing else. And then they look at church leaders or family members or both and and they're like, wait a second, like you're banking on your golf games that you played with this guy mm -hmm. as a as a defense for him right. molesting and raping right. and humiliating me. Yes. Like it just it doesn't compute and it can't compute. It can't make sense in any normal world. And that's why I really try to get people to realize that appealing to me. Um, and I think this is what maybe makes me a little bit unique, but if people try to appeal to me on the basis of the relationship that they've had with the person who's the subject mm -hmm. of um, the allegations. And Let's I'm like, put this in simple terms. In the community, I have had numerous people come up to me and say, still, what a shame that he is in prison because he helped so many people reach God. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So based on mm -hmm. that, it's like they want to tip the scales up this right. way and it doesn't work. Cannot yeah. work. Doesn't the good not. outweigh the bad right. in those circumstances? He did things. so much good. Oh, he did. But mm -hmm. bring it up here. He right. also did so much bad. Right. Yeah. yeah. So well, I, I think for me, it's taken years to sort of let go or change that concept of duality that someone is either all good or all bad because mm -hmm. I guess that was something that was really hard in my mind to grasp when I first um, had it the concrete evidence yes he's an abuser yes he did abuse me it was then okay what about all the good memories I have with him so was that all manipulation or was he really a good parent in some ways? Did he actually love me? Did he not? And it was overwhelming. Like, But you have to separate all of those instances and just think good people can do bad things and bad people can do good things. Mm -hmm. It's not like a one or the other in every case. I yeah. appreciate what you said so much, Alex, because for those who are wives of abusers who may be listening... The struggle is real in that aspect, mm -hmm. too. Um, I go through that every day. You know, was there really love for me? Or was there this intent that, hey, I'm going to marry her and we're going to have a lot of children. And that will give me access to a lot of children. Mm -hmm. Because we talked about family before we got married while we were dating. And I wanted a big family. And it was like, yes, he, he did too. And, you know, all of this. And you feel so totally mixed up in your mind. Yeah. How could he love me yet abuse my children? How does that happen? How To harm one of our children. So I totally get what you're saying, that the struggle is real. It's very real. I think what's helped me bring some clarity to that is separating that even farther and saying, all right, yeah, like we'll never make sense of that if we if, if we think in terms of good and bad and like right. we all do right. good things, yeah. we all do bad yeah. things. Yeah. Like there are things in my life that I hope never come to light, right? Yeah. Like all yeah. of us have these things that, that we do. But right. then in in the Bible, 
you have this really clear um, um, picture of deception and people masquerading as good people while they're doing right. really horrific things right. intentionally, willfully, and joyfully. Um, they're doing those things knowing the harm that it's bringing on their victims, and they're doing it anyway. Mm -hmm. um, there's this distinction between those people and people like the three of us mm -hmm. who we we wrestle with different temptations and different things, whether it's, you know, driving like a maniac and speeding everywhere we go. Uh, <clears throat> Um, or whether, you know what I mean? Like yeah. whether it's gossip, yes. whether it's, yes. um, whether it's addiction, self-harm kind of stuff, like all of us have these vices that we, we know what it's like to wrestle with and to have those things overcome us. Mm -hmm. But we also know what it's like to overcome those things and, and to pull out of it and to be racked with guilt and all that stuff. That's not what abusers do though. And that's not, they don't operate mm -hmm. Anywhere close to how we operate. And that's what people really need to understand. I is, think two words you use, Jimmy. I'll interject and I'll let you finish. Deceit mm -hmm. and willful. Yeah. Two things. Mm -hmm. Deceit yeah, it's, it's and the, willful. Just knowing 100% this is going to harm this girl. And I'm going to come off as the best mom in the world mm -hmm. while I'm harming her in the worst possible way. Right. That's yeah, an abuser. That's right. That's so it's, an abuser. So it's all masquerading, but mm -hmm. it's not masquerading because you're trying to cover your, your own sins. No. Uh, because addicts do that, right? Uh, drug exactly. addicts, alcohol yeah. addicts. Yeah. Like they'll lie, they'll lie about mm -hmm. um, their addiction to, to try to cover yeah. up what they're doing because they're racked with guilt and shame. Yeah, this is um, different. And yeah. that's self-harm, mm -hmm. but this is... This is others' harm, where mm -hmm. you're willfully, intentionally deceiving other people in order to steal away that which doesn't belong to you. It belongs to, mm -hmm. your innocence belonged to you. Mm -hmm. Your sexuality belonged to you. That was mm -hmm. stolen from you. Yes. Um, and the abuser, like we can't, I, th I think we need to move beyond this idea of good and bad and i think yeah. that's why we and i wrestle with it too because mm -hmm. i go back and i think about all the good stuff too and i'm like man like 98 percent of my memories growing up were positive memories yeah. they were mm -hmm. fun they were like good they were uh nurturing and you know all these other things but it was only until i could realize like okay it's not that he had a good side and a bad side it wasn't this jekyll and hyde it was his DNA makeup is a liar and a deceiver mm -hmm. to his core. And he still is a liar mm -hmm. and a deceiver to his core. And there's this distinction where when you realize, wait a second, like these guys, they open their mouths and they lie. And I, I know you read mm -hmm. Anna Salter's book, I but there's, um, yeah. there's a quote in there where she asks him, something to the effect of like, how do you, how do you pull off all these lies? Mm -hmm. And he said, y you're asking the wrong question, Dr. Salter. You assume that when I'm abusing, um, that's when the lies begin. Mm -hmm. But in reality, every single time I open yeah. my mouth, it's I'm lying. It's a lie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. And that's, that, that, and that's, that's hard, really, though, really eye opening. Who, um, you know, when it's your relative, your father, your husband, your mm -hmm. brother, your mother, it's hard. And you do wrestle as humans. We wrestle with that. Well, gee, was I ever really, truly loved? Yeah. Did that ever mean anything? Did, yeah. You know, but. Yeah. That's that's just one of the, I think, after effects of abuse that, that mm -hmm. survivors have to wrestle with forever. Yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, Alex did, did having us report right away. We reported, let's see that you came to, to me on a Friday. Um, I think mom, the day before Monday morning, we were in the police station reporting. Um, so this all happened really quickly. Did, did, did us reporting that bring a sense of justice and closure to you? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. Um, yes, it goes back to that feeling of relief that he was going to be out of the general population and in prison so he couldn't get to any more kids to abuse them mm -hmm. but then 
it opened up this whole guilty complex um, within myself that why didn't I know how to report sooner? Like, why yeah. didn't I have the tools or the knowledge to tell someone when I was a kid and how many more people could I have protected if I would have said something years earlier? Um, so I don't think I'll ever, you know, feel full closure in that aspect of things, but, you know, I'll never regret reporting and I'll, mm -hmm. you know, always be grateful that he's in prison where he belongs. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I think that's a component that we probably need to talk a lot more about, um, with survivors, um, because you know, we, we hear it and I think the words are there, but I, but I think it's so hard to compute with your person that when you're a kid, I mean, I think about, I look at my Isaac is five years old. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, he's not almost six, but I look at him and I'm like, if, if he were having the most horrific, painful, humiliating horror scene being marked out for him in the privacy of a home by somebody who claimed to love him and, and, and care for him. And that, that horror scene was playing out in his life. Like just now me as me as a parent of that child, I, in a million years, I couldn't imagine being like, well, Isaac, why, why couldn't you figure it out? Mm -hmm. You know, I know we talked last week about training kids, but ultimately in the end, so we can train them so oh, far, but, yeah. but abusers are highly sophisticated, so highly sophisticated. All of this. Yes. And a um, child's mind, how do you decipher all of that, that mixed up? This is somebody who loves you one minute, mm -hmm. who's feeding you, clothing you, taking you on trips and the yeah. next moment. They're hurting you in the most painful way, but you don't even understand if it's okay, if it's not. Lots of times they tell you, <clears throat> this is just another form of love. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm loving you, you know. So how does a child understand Yeah, that? and that's something, I mean, when we had Judge Aquilino on the show, um, she, she was really adamant, and she's like, you know, make sure that you're careful when you're talking about this to where... You don't even make it sound like it's the responsibility of that kid right. to yeah. Never. Um, to Never. to report and to defend mm -hmm. themselves because at the end of the day they're kids. Um, yeah. You were a kid, so you know, and you had um, virtually no, and then and then very fragmented memories. So it's not like you had this this stack of journals and you know it was all mm -hmm. written out and you knew exactly what was happening when it was happening. Like you didn't have that. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, I talk about this when I, when I um, do trainings, like the amount of information that you and I had from you was really not a lot of information yeah. at all. Cause I, I think no. you didn't have a lot of information, no, like, including your own, from your own abuse. Yeah, no evidence because like I said, I don't even know what year or years it happened. Right? Yeah. And I think, you know, that gets into a whole nother topic too about standing with victims when they're trying to report because it's not as if your memories work the way my memories work mm -hmm. or your memories work like your memories wow. very typically are incredibly fragmented and there is that duality where where you're trying to make sense of your memories that are coming back and it's it's just really really gray well, yeah. any trauma event is like that. And sure. even for me to remember beyond the email, and I remember you and I crying, I remember hugging you. I don't remember words that we said. I, I don't remember anything except, you know, we need to talk to Jimmy. How do you want to do that? Do you want to go by yourself or do you want me to go with you? But beyond that, there's no memory. It mm -hmm. was it, it, the trauma. So I can't imagine a child experiencing abuse to remember details. Oh, how's that happen? You want yeah, to block that out. You and, want, it's, you need and it's to block such a process. To survive. Yeah, yes. it's, it's really a process. So to sit with victims and to have the patience. Um, but instead they hear things like, well, why, 
Why are you just now telling? Why are yeah, you just now yeah. reporting? Why? Why didn't you? Come what do you mean you don't ago? have memories? Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, yeah. No. If if you don't have memories, then why are you telling me this? You know these little bits and pieces, and you expect you expect a police officer to do anything with that? You know those are the yeah. kinds of things that victims hear constantly. And I, uh, like I don't know. Like people ask me a lot when I do trainings. They're like, "How did you know?" how to how to believe your sister and how did you know how to go to the police and how did you know you know all the things that we did and and at the end of the day it, it's common sense yeah that's what um, i it is. always it's not rocket question, science why would someone want to make any of this up right like why would i want to talk about Bingo. any of this right. if it why didn't would actually have right you at age 20 want to start a process that could could potentially destroy your whole family all the relationships that you had why she right you know i, I you had, love that perfect yeah, yeah i mean perfect yes you had right. everything to lose yes and very little to gain yes. Mm -hmm. um yes so you know people need to remember that too this right. isn't something that they're like oh i'm I'm gonna make I'm gonna make this up, you know, and that's yeah. the thing too. Like if somebody's gonna make something up about somebody, it's not gonna be sexual abuse, um, ninety nine percent of the time. Um, it's gonna be something uh, that, pe yeah, you well, know, this, people this might look down fun. on somebody. This but this is not fun. Facing yeah, people police don't is make up fun. allegations There's, of sexual abuse. There was the abuse. potential of a trial. Alex, being 20, knew that. That would not be fun. Right. This There was potential of dragging other people, you know, other people being brought into this. This would not be fun. Why would somebody age 20, a young right. lady, even want to begin that? And Or any abuse victim. Why? Why? Yeah, you know, they wouldn't. They wouldn't is the thing that Alex and you were trying to drive home. They wouldn't. Yeah. It's, it's much, it makes much more sense to believe the story believe it yeah um whether there is every fact available or not and it's not going to be any of us that that went through anything traumatic we can't remember every detail those things happen they they come in flashes mm -hmm. to us and sometimes many many years later i still have flashes of when i was a child of things that happened and i'm ready to kick the bucket really so <laughs> you're getting there i mean I'm we're so there. close so I'm close to there. putting you in a nursing home <laughs> oh stop that stop me and that. alex are, me and alex have been doing financial planning <laughs> trying to figure out how we're going to afford this i know you've been contacting the whole family and you're all solid on this <laughs> Oh. Um, man, I guess final question. We could we could go forever. And I'm know, trying to yeah. look at the time. Yeah. We've, yeah. Um, I guess we'll just have to do a part two, Alex. Sometime. There you yeah. go. But what what would be your message to abuse victims um, who are living with their secret of abuse and they've never told anybody? Um, I think for me. The most, the biggest benefit, other than of course protecting the kids that was happening to, uh, the biggest benefit was starting my whole healing journey. I had been living with symptoms of anxiety and depression, eating disorders, self harm, pretty much my whole life, and it was never until I actually connected the dots and started talking about it that I was ever able to um, start any kind of healing process. And so I would tell um, survivors or victims of abuse that even if you can't talk to your own family about it, um, there are people out there who will listen. There are therapists and coaches and maybe friends, random people on the internet. Like, mm -hmm. the whole world shares their life on social media nowadays. You can find other people like you without even really having to try, I think. Okay. Yeah, support groups now are... Um, it's a lot different than it was 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, we've have some really solid groups, solid advocates. Um, there are people out there. Yeah. yeah right. That you can share your story with. And sometimes, I mean, for some people, I think it would be easier to tell a complete stranger. Yeah, I think mm -hmm. so too. Cause um, then you don't have to worry about is someone going to believe you or not if they don't actually know you. Yeah. 
Yeah. There's a lot of wisdom in what the two of you say, and I think you don't totally grasp it sometimes. <clears throat> I appreciate so much, Alex, your willingness to talk publicly. It's not easy um, at all. Abuse is such a sensitive topic, and um, I appreciate your courage as a mother of you. I still stand amazed. Jimmy, the same is true for you. There was no hesitation. Mm -mm. You adored your dad. I mean, you followed in his footsteps. And Alex knew that when she and told Alex me. Knew she that. knew the and relationship to see we the had. the two of you who stand strong and stand together, and for a mother, there's no greater thing. I, I can say that. And I appreciate I would love to hear more. Uh, I hope we can have Alex as a guest again sometime in the future, near future. I think she has so much wisdom to share, and you, you uh, do so in such a poised and confident way. When you talk about your healing journey, I think people need to hear a little bit more of, of your healing journey. And it is a, a journey, and it is healing. And I think that shows in you the calmness you now have as you know, you're opposed to how anxious you were and um, just all the fears you had. And now I see a poised young lady, married business lady. Um, just, you know, I see so many wonderful things happening and I think people would like to hear about that more. Yeah, there's, a, I, I mean, our story, it's a story of hope. I mean, it's a, it it, is. people, people, it's interesting. Church people want to hear how we've reconciled with my dad and how he's changed his life. And I, and I'm like, that's no. not, that's not our story at, at all. Not, that's no. not our story. No. But our story is a story of hope. It's a story of, it's um, a beautiful story of, of us yeah. still having all kinds of struggles. Um, still our family has a lot of heartache and heartbreak, um, but it's a but we're a family that sticks together and we help each other out and um, we're all supportive of each other and well and um, when you can see um, a member of your family on this healing journey and you see witness the healing taking place is beautiful yeah so, it is yeah so who wants to come up with the truth bomb I think granny you always have some I you drop some know. wisdom I think well, today has been a joy, but that's all there is to it. I think that when we do uh, take that first step, that first right step, that there is always going to be somebody there to help us fall in line and help support us. And I appreciated what you said, Alex, that if it's not your family, there are therapists, there are coaches, there are you go online, there's help available. and. Um, there is hope. So yeah. I want to leave that with all people today. Absolutely. There is hope. Well, yes. Alex, thank you for being yes. with us today. Thanks and for um, me. absolutely. And to our listeners, thank you for tuning in. And we will catch you next round. Thanks again for listening to today's episode. Thank you to our patrons who make the podcast possible. If you found it helpful, please follow on Spreaker and search for the Speaking Out on Sex Abuse podcast in your favorite podcast app. Be sure to hit subscribe and rate the show. If you believe in what we do, consider supporting the podcast by becoming a patron and check out the cool rewards our patrons receive. Share with your friends and tell the world. Join us in speaking out on sex abuse so we can change the tides and prevent abuse.